guys, welcome to the brave new world we live in. You're gonna watch this movie and you're gonna wonder how the heck Peter made it because there are so many high level shots. We wanna show you just what one person can do with the tools that are out there. And we're gonna teach you all the secrets right here in this video. AI Ooh. upscale it. <laughs> Ooh, that's a little spicy detail right there. It's a little right spicy, there. good, I like good that. tip for you, yeah. Today's a very special day because Peter's movie, Scooty, just dropped. He's been working on it for over three years? Over three years, it's it's uh, way past due, but you know what, it's done now. Look, you're gonna watch this movie and you're gonna wonder how the heck Peter made it. Because it's literally, in my opinion, like Marvel level visual effects. I don't know about that. He has a fully animated character that looks photo real for the entire time. And everybody that watches this is going to have questions about how you did these shots because there are so many high level shots. So this project was originally going to be my senior thesis project in college. And then the pandemic hit and then I dropped out of college and then two years later so three years total <laughs> it's finally finished i was like oh two, two or three hundred vfx shots i can get that done in a few months no it took much longer than that but you know what it's finally done and i'm very happy with it and i'm pumped to show you guys how i did it we want to show you just what one person can do with the tools that are out there and we're going to teach you all the secrets right here in this video let's get into some secrets so if you're watching something with a 3D character in it, a CG character, here's what it entails. Filming on set with an imaginary thing there. You have to get your eye lines right. You have to get your framing right for something that is literally not there. You can't screw it up. Then of course you have to model this thing. You have to texture this thing. You have to rig it where you basically put a fake skeleton inside of it and like connect everything so it moves correctly. Then you have to light it for each scene that it's going to be in. You have to cut anything out that's going to be in front of it by hand. Then you have to composite it where you all take all those, take all those layers, you put them together, you match the colors, you match the gamma and the contrast so it ideally looks like it belongs in your shot. And then you do that over and over and over. It is so much work. So how did you pull it off? How did you make a CG character all by yourself? Okay, so there were like two or 300 VFX shots, but towards the end, I found a workflow that made it go pretty quickly. Through all of the tools that have been coming out in the past few years, it's just become so accessible through motion capture, through 3D scanning sets and things like that. So really utilizing those tools to my advantage was the only reason I could have done this. Ooh, creepy. So one of the beautiful things about shooting something without any money or permits is that you get these beautiful moments of people being mad at you. <laughs> so there is a moment where Matt is throwing a scooter on the ground and water comes from above out of nowhere and just drops on him. And that <laughs> was actually someone in real life who was mad that we were making a lot of noise and dropped water on us. But it was so funny because Matt immediately just happened to fall after that. <laughs> I was wondering what that was. I felt like a light had turned on. See, there's water. That's what people have been saying. So I need to, I need to emphasize that. You need a water yeah. splash. Yeah. All right. So your robot looks perfectly photoreal. How did you get that step? You know, you have a 3D model and dirt does not exist in CGI. If you leave a 3D model on your hard drive, it's not gonna collect dust. The more you move it around, it doesn't scratch the edges. Yeah, up. exactly. Like you, <laughs> you drag the file across your desktop and it gets dirtier. <laughs> no, so you have to add that stuff in manually because that's what makes things look realistic are the imperfections. And so there's this amazing software called Substance Painter where you basically import your 3D model and it does some processing on it. It says, okay, where are the contours of this? Where are the little crevices that dirt would get into? And then you can use that information to drive textures. There's a tire on Scooty that's filled with a bit of mud in the, in the little crevasses. You can also do things like the little edges of, of metal where there's paint on it, but on the edge it would get scuffed off. Those little details at a distance add so much in the realm of like photorealism. Yeah, I let you get away with just nice close-up shots of the head. Right, so the eyebrows were a big thing. Originally the model didn't have any eyebrows and I was really struggling through the animation and the voice to really like sell the emotion of the character. How do people express themselves? It's through eyebrows, right? You know, The Rock is great at that. So then I just threw these little handlebar or, or brake pad eyebrows on there and it helped sell the emotion so much better because then you could like bring them down for anger or up for surprise or like up and slanted for sadness. It really helps take the animation a long way. Notice also for the, the eyes, you'd use the light pattern to like do like, you know, eyelids up a little bit or you know, like eyelids down or like wide eyed. Mm -hmm. I did this one lesson a long time ago that I've, I've never lost it. It's always stuck with me. And it was just expressions and it's eyebrows and it's how far down on the pupil and the iris your top eyelid goes and how far up your bottom eyelid goes. And the relationship of those three things is all you need for right. every human emotion. I, I got so good at smiling with a mask during the pandemic. It's like, even with this, if you just, you know, you go like that, it's like, I'm smiling, you know? <laughs> I mean, you just kind of look insane. But. 
Now you have to animate it. And right. you just sit there by hand. That'd be impossible to animate this mm -hmm. for that many shots, right? I did that for the Spider-Man uh, short back in the day, and that, <laughs> that just was hell. Thankfully, we have motion capture now. Originally, we tried to get motion capture data on set. We had the actor, Riley Olson. He was wearing a motion capture suit on set, but he tragically sat down really hard on the hub of the motion capture suit in a car and disconnected some of the wires. And so then for the entirety of production, we did not have a functioning motion capture suit on set. So we had to figure something else out. Now in these scenes, if you look, we actually have Riley just, just acting as if he's a human character in the scene. No motion capture suit, no CG, no nothing. And then we use what's called rotomation, which is, they, they use it on Spider-Man a lot, which is where you look at the actor, you're like, this is basically what they did and you match that in your animation <laughs> instead. But I did a bit more of like a manual approach to that where I put on the motion capture suit and I watched the footage over and over. I was like, okay, I see you, Riley. And then I stood up in my motion capture suit and acted it out the same way. And then we got motion capture that was pretty similar to what the guy did on set. And when you filmed the guy on set, you would just film again without him there. You didn't paint him out, right? No, no, so we do the classic. It's like, get the shot, all right, run out of the frame. Now we get the background so then we can put the CG over the background. So how about later on where like, you know, we're having dinner time. You would do the shot again without Riley. This is just empty shots, just with Matt by himself. Yeah, so at a certain point, tensions were high. We were stressed out. And at that point we were like, okay, we'll just put Riley in later on. Just don't worry, but let's just, let's just film. Riley is acting behind the camera just for voice reference for Matt. So this whole party sequence, Riley was not in any of these shots. We just had Matt acting against nothing and we just threw Sco Scooty in later on. I love that you have like split color lighting. So it really like embeds the robot in there? Yeah, that's something I really remember. We were working on anime fidget spinners back in the day, and we had a shot of Mike's finger getting sliced off, and you guys lit it with a strong blue light coming from the side. And just that little detail, that specificity, made the CG look so much better. It helped contour the CG and root it in the scene. And so having different color temperatures of lights really helps solidify the CG character in there. Now I also noticed you have all these shadows in the chair there. So yeah, another great use of the Polycam app on the iPhone is if I I have an object or a seat that Scooty is interacting with and I need to get the proper shadows and reflections on that object, then I can just scan it with my phone, throw it in the 3D software and set it to be what's called a shadow catcher, which is, it's an invisible object that only displays the shadows that are being cast onto it. And so then when you slap it on top of the original footage, you get the correct shadows that follow the contour of the object, even though Scooty wasn't even in the scene. So I love that you're using accessible motion capture suits to give you motion, and they're using accessible 3D scanning tools to let you scan all the objects in the scene for catching shadows, or scanning the environment for like getting correct reflections and light. You are knocking out weeks and weeks of work. Because this took three years to make, multiple pieces of software came out <laughs> in that time that made all this stuff so much easier. So a shot that would have taken me a few days at the beginning of the process would have taken me half a day at the end of the process. It was fantastic. Take these, these shots in the alleyway, for instance. How did you make it look like it was filmed on the same camera as the actual shot. It's all about lighting. And whenever we were on set, I would scan the set and then you have a near perfect 3D recreation of the set. Did you do HDRIs also? So you can't 3D scan the sky, it's too far away. So you 3D scan the set around you and then you throw in an HDRI, which is a high dynamic range image. And so if you drop your CG character into that, it'll light it pretty accurately. And that mixed with the 3D scan of the set gives you perfect lighting. How did you get your HDRIs? There's a beautiful website called polyhaven.com slash HDRI. And it's just a community compiled library of HDRIs and they have every lighting condition, sunny, cloudy, sunset, and you find the one that's most accurate to your scene and just plop it in. Granted, you lit it the same as your actual shot, but it still looks like it was filmed with the same camera. Like It blends. How did you actually do that part? So you have your 3D render and you have your footage. And usually if you just slap them on top of each other, it doesn't look very good. The contrast is going to be off. The shadows and highlights are going to be different in each shot. So you take your scientific eye and you use color tools like levels or curves to match the shadows, match the highlights, and match the saturation of each shot. And that's pretty much it. On top of that, all cameras have a little bit of blur to them. You match the blur, you match the depth of field, and there you go.
right, so this is the first time we ever see Scooty. He is struck by lightning. Why? Because he's got to get into the video. Because he's got to be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help but notice you have lighting from the lightning, like on the pole there, and there's shadows happening on the wall. So we tried to be good VFX artists, and we brought a big LED panel to the set, and we tried to flicker it, you know, to make it light up the environment, but it was not bright enough. The day was too bright. So I ended up doing a 3D reconstruction of the scene to project light from the lightning onto. I just took the raw footage and I threw it into Reality Capture, which is a 3D scanning program. And then I used that very rough mesh to then block out the geometry of the scene. Using that, I could just cast naturally the light that would be emitting from the lightning onto the scenes, which goes a long way in selling the lightning effect. I was pretty proud of the way this uh, scooter formation scene took shape because I reversed my animation of Scooty just getting up off of the ground and then I did a physics simulation of all the pieces falling off of it and then you reverse that footage and then it looks like all the pieces are like magnetizing to it. All right, so if you take a look at like this shot right here where he's up against the wall. Traditionally, you would film the background and then you'd have your CG model and you'd have to composite in the model over the background. But for a shot like this, that's kind of a waste of time. Like, couldn't yeah. you just do a 3D background? Like, couldn't you just polycam it? At this point, yeah, it's like, uh, towards the end, there were so many VFX shots and I had to get like 20 done every day. I was like, there's no more time. No more time to composite things ever. It's all gonna be done purely 3D. And so I actually would go back to locations like this one. I just drove over, I scanned it, I drove back home, I plopped it in, and then you have a perfect CG background to just drop your model into. You don't have to even composite anything because it's all just straight out of the renderer. We actually see this happening a lot now in like Marvel films. Like they'll have stuff filmed, they at least have the reference, but like, yeah, it was easy to just replace the entire thing. If you're putting a 3D object into something that already exists, it's tough to get it to interact with light in that environment. Whereas if you have a purely CG environment, all the shadows and reflections and lighting are just natural. And so you get really realistic lighting on the background just from your 3D subject being there in the first place. Okay, so this is part where he has a box. <laughs> Nico, I don't want to talk about the box. <laughs> He's holding this server. Taking this in for uh, maintenance. As I'm watching this, I'm like, that looks like a pretty expensive prop. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like a big piece of metal that needs to be laser cut. So like looking at the rest of this film, I'm not seeing a lot of expensive props or locations, but that looks like an expensive prop, but it also looks a little VFX-y. But he's holding it. I'm like, there's no way Peter had him hold something like a cardboard box and just VFX in an actual box for this, did he? So <laughs> let, me, let me just show you the raw footage here. <laughs> oh my God, poor man. <laughs> so this was straight up a green cardboard box that this guy was carrying. The thing about this cardboard box in particular is that it was falling apart. It was not a rigid structure. And so sometimes it would be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. And when you're 3D tracking something, that really throws <laughs> things off. So I had to hand track a lot of this box. <sighs> when you say hand track, you mean you just eyeballed it. Eyeballing would be if you literally just like rotate the box into place and like just put it there and hope it looks good. What I ended up doing was I did a 3D track, like a computed 3D track, but I hand tracked all the points for that. I would go through and have like a little tracker point and I would put it on the corner of the box. I'll go to the next frame. I would drag it to where that corner of the box was. And I did that for every corner for like however many frames and then hit compute. And it gave a pretty janky outcome usually. And then it was a lot of <laughs> tweaking to get it to look good. Oh man. And then you have to deal with the shadows. You have to deal with this little finger being all up over it. There are so <laughs> many liberties taken with this where there are some places where it's being squished and stretched in really unnatural ways if you look closely. Yeah, this shot, you can see in the beginning of this shot. <laughs> it does go from being like a long air conditioner style to like more of a box. That's literally because the box was falling apart. <laughs> Part of it was like sagging. Oh. <laughs> what? So the guy who made this prop did a great job, but we just used it so much that it ended up falling apart. So I also noticed that, you know, the robot's just in a lot of footage you filmed. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you motion track all of it? You mean as opposed to like having a static background? Yeah, as opposed to like a locked off camera mm -hmm. or, you know, a fully 3D scene. It's a mixture of a few different techniques. We have the After Effects automatic camera tracker, which is just a godsend. You basically just feed it your footage, hit analyze, and it spits out a perfect 3D camera that then you can bring into your scene and you plop your model in and it just sticks. Another one is the Blender camera tracker which is built in, it's a bit more manual, but it's better for the tougher shots where After Effects can't quite understand it. So yeah, it was pretty straightforward. That was honestly one of the easiest parts was camera tracking all those shots. Come on, I got places to be. 
So these shots of, the, of Scooty in the car, 100% CG car. 100% CG car, real background. So you just got a shot looking out the window or something while you drove down the street? Exactly, I bought a $30 like suction mounted camera rig and I just put my DSLR on it and drove down that street in San Francisco and old fashioned rear projection style in the shot. So like this shot here, like there's camera motion happening, like it's mm -hmm. framing up. Are you actually just taking your background shot and then just cropping into an area and then back out? So I'm using the Ian Hubert method where you have your footage in your 3D scene. So then you can take another camera and kind of do your own camera move even though you already filmed the footage with a different camera. That's how we did clock blockers. If you 3D track your camera, and you take that 3D tracked camera and you project the footage from that camera, it's as if you're just creating a window into reality again and now you have a stabilized window. The perfect way of explaining it. So yeah, I use that a ton on this. A lot of the footage of uh, Jake blading down the hills in San Francisco was that. We had footage of him on a green screen and we 3D tracked that and then put the CG background in there and then could animate a camera independently of the original camera. So how about this? That's gotta be a 3D background right there, no? Yeah, that, this shot is 100% 3D. That's all kit bash 3D skyscrapers. So this is all 3D too? Uh-huh. That looks like it's a real shot. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy with that one. I think the fabric moving and the hair moving helps sell it a lot. How about the background here? So this is a giant large scale satellite 3D model of San Francisco that I got from 3dcadbrowser.com. Threw it in there, it's done. It was amazing. <laughs> this shot of uh, Jake holding onto the airplane. I'm so proud of this shot. Is he, I'm guessing <laughs> well, he's just lying the on the ground. Yep. <laughs> Wait a minute. Those are CG legs and torso. You yep. cut them off at the shoulders. I cut them off at the shoulders. Wow. So we very strategically placed Matt in his clothing on set so that we could cut just around his shoulder and replace his second half. The legs are hand animated. I could have made them look more realistic, but I just thought it was so funny how floppy and like all over the place they were. So I kind of handed up a bit. I can't but, help but notice that you're dropping the exposure a little bit. It looks like where the hair is motion blurring. You know what? I think I'm using Andrew Kramer's motion blur technique. Andrew Kramer, king of VFX, came into the studio and let Ren in on a little secret for motion blur to make it look way more accurate. Normally CG motion blur, at least in After Effects or things like that, is just perfectly blurred out. Whereas in real life, it has a little bit more shape to it. And it's a little bit more full. So in <laughs> After Effects, you put on, uh, you change your color space to 32 bit and you put on an exposure uh, effect to turn the exposure all the way down. Then you calculate your motion blur uh, and then you put an exposure effect turning it all the way back up. And then for some reason, it just magically looks way better. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. It, it's, like, it's like an ND film. Basically. It changes the exposure of what's behind it. Right, exactly. And so I don't know if it was like the bit depth in my camera that I was shooting at or something like that, but I tried to key these shots using blue screen techniques and it just was not working very well. It looked all chunky and the hair, it looked like bad blue screen hair. So I ended up using After Effects's Rotobrush tool, which is basically just an AI assisted rotoscoping tool where it helps you cut out something over a long period of frames. And it has this amazing edge refine feature where you basically just like click over the hair and it's like, all right, I got you. And it just just, like makes it look amazing. <laughs> it's really nice actually. It's, it's like great. one of the features that After Effects has. It's legitimately good. Yeah. Everything <laughs> needs that soft refine tool. Yeah. So this shot right here. Yeah. 3D model? No, that's a Shutterstock drone. Okay. That's Shutterstock has so much of my money. Topaz Labs was so amazing for this project. You know, you can buy stock footage at like 4K and it's like $300. Or you can buy stock footage at like 720p and it's like 50 bucks. But then you just use Topaz Labs to AI Ooh. upscale it. <laughs> Ooh, that's a little spicy detail right there. It's a little there. spicy. Good, I like good that. tip for you. Yeah. You guys, welcome to the brave new world we live in. <laughs> <Really>. <laughs> Nico, how's, how's your head feeling? My head's feeling great because I feel inspired. I feel like I can go out and shoot a movie and do all the effects. Honestly, you did some incredible work here. And if you haven't watched the video yet, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Go to the channel Corridor. It's where we put all our short films, including Scooty. Yes. This has been a lot of fun going through this with you. I'm super hyped with how this movie turned out and I'm excited for everybody to see it. So go watch it if you haven't. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Validate me. Validate me. I want it. Push my ego to the stars. Let's go, so let's go, I'm ready to blast off, let's go!